Greetings, church, and welcome to the meeting house of the First Baptist Church in America on this first Sunday in March. We're delighted that you've chosen to join us for this service of prayer, song, and reflection. Know that this and every day, God loves you. If God had a fridge, your picture would be on it. God loves you and each of us because we have been so loved love others in return. These days and this time continues to remind us that church has never been a building, but a people. And in all our many places, you continue to be the church, looking out for and taking care of one another. We are not meeting in person, but church never closed. Please continue to send your prayer requests by phone or message to the church office so that we can best know how to hold you in prayer. Thank you for ensuring that the work of church continues through your offerings. Your gifts support our local and global ministries together with our partners. Know that what you do makes a difference. Much appreciation. If you would like more information about our community, visit our website at fbcia.org. Friends, this morning we are in for a real treat. Our guest preacher today is Amanda Tyler, the Executive Director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. She leads the organization as it upholds the historic Baptist principle of religious liberty while defending the free exercise of religion and protecting its establishment by government. She also serves as the co-host of the BJC podcast series, Respecting Religion. Today, she offers her perspective on the grounding virtues required for building and being the beloved community that we have been discussing. She's a graduate of Georgetown University and the University of Texas School of Law. As a member of the Texas and U.S. Supreme Court Bar, she has experience working in Congress in private legal practice and serving as a law clerk for a federal judge. I know that we will be blessed by the word that she brings us today. It is our practice to share the Lord's Supper together the first Sunday of each month. This morning in all our varied places, we will come together and share this meal. When Jesus set the example by doing this with his disciples, he told them to do this and to remember. He wasn't specific about what would go in the cup or on the plate, so I invite you now to pause this message and gather the beverage and bread of your choosing so that you'll be able to participate in that portion of our service when it comes. Go ahead and get it, I'll wait. Brothers and sisters, we know that we can and we do pray from anywhere, with words, with our bodies, with our actions, with our breath. Prepare yourselves now to join together in a word of prayer. Make yourself comfortable, take a few breaths, release what you no longer need to hold on to anymore so that you may fully enter into this service. Allow the breath of God to refresh and inspire you and let the peace of God fill your heart. Join with me in the responsive prayer on your screen. O oh God, it is you who gives us another day of life. With your help, God, we pray you set us on the proper course today. Control our tongues. Keep me from saying things which make trouble and from involving myself in arguments which only make bad situations worse and we get nowhere. Guide our thoughts. Shut the door of my mind against all envious and jealous thoughts. 
Shut it against all bitter and resentful thoughts. Shut it against all ugly and demeaning thoughts. Help us to live today in wholesomeness, humility, and love. All through today, grant that no hurtful thought may enter my mind and no hurtful word come from my mouth. This we ask for your love's sake. We pray now, continuing in the manner that Jesus taught us, saying, Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm reading today from the Good News Bible. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I urge you then, I who am a prisoner, because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard of God, and when he called you, be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. There is one body and one spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all mankind, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. Each one of us has received a special gift in preparation to what Christ has given. I'll now read from chapters uh, 4, verses 11 through 16. It was he who gave gifts to mankind. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so it shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every sifting wind of the teaching of deceitful men who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. Well, it is good to be with you, the good people of First Baptist Church in America this morning. I'm grateful for the technology that allows me to join you virtually. And I also long for a time when it is safe for us to be together in the same space again. Thank you for the many ways that you and the church have partnered with Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty or BJC for many years in our shared mission of advocating for faith, freedom for all. I was particularly delighted by the invitation to be with you all during Lent as you explore the grounding virtues of the On Being Project. And this morning, I'd like to reflect on the virtue of adventurous civility. The project says that adventurous civility honors the difficulty of what we face and the complexity of what it means to be human. It's about creating new possibilities for living forward while being different and even continuing to hold profound disagreement. I love this definition because it gets right to the heart of being human. It's the challenge of life 
particularly American life right now. Difference, disagreement, complexity. Adventurous civility also echoes a recurrent theme of this still young year of 2021, unity. What President Biden called the most elusive thing in a democracy in his inaugural address. Adventurous civility is hard, but rewarding stuff. There isn't a quick fix. We can't just say the word unity or civility and magically have it. To impose unity or civility, we risk oppression of stifling minority dissenting voices to the will of the powerful majority. I think the writer of Ephesians understood the challenges of adventurous civility, along with the importance of other grounding virtues like humility and patience. This passage first reminds us of what we as Christians have in common. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But the writer doesn't just leave us there, but then reminds us of our beautiful and yes, messy diversity. We are reminded that we were given by God's grace different gifts. Those differences aren't to be minimized, but harmonized to the measure of the full stature of Christ. And we can ward off the inevitable distractions and diversions from this measure by speaking the truth in love to one another. When I think about someone who practiced adventurous civility, who honored dissent and disagreement, even in himself, who spoke the truth in love and respected his neighbors as his equals, do you know whom I think of? Roger Williams. He's not someone I would ever call polite or nice, but he was adventurously civil. Now, I certainly recognize the dangers in speaking to this church in any kind of authoritative way on Roger Williams. And I am not an authority. I'm an admirer in his ability to stay true to his convictions while simultaneously honoring the convictions of his neighbors. According to Miroslav Volf in his book, Flourishing, Why We Need Religion in a Globalized World, Williams is the preeminent example of a religious exclusivist who was also a political pluralist. Wolf describes Roger Williams as an intransigent defender of religious truth if ever there was one. But Williams also recognized the equality of humans, that our freedom before God is something that binds us together, even as our approach to God can be wildly divergent between one another and even as Williams experienced within ourselves over a lifetime. Civility to me is the shared recognition of what binds us together and a respectful engagement with our neighbors as our equals. Though I haven't used these exact words to describe what we are doing at BJC, I do believe that we are about this work of adventurous civility. We bring together churches, denominations, individuals, most of whom are Baptist, but not everyone, people and groups who disagree about a great number of things, but agree on the importance of protecting everyone's faith freedom. We recognize that this value is fragile, that it depends on each generation to advocate for its protection and respond to challenges to it. We try to engage in the public debate on these very contentious and hot button issues in a respectful and truthful way, not shying away from our religious differences, but highlighting them as a source of strength. Well, one of the great challenges to religious freedom right now is the rise of Christian nationalism, a political ideology and cultural framework that tries to merge our identities as Americans and Christians. It suggests that true Christians are Americans and that to be a real American, one must be Christian. 
It's an ideology that Roger Williams rejected before there even was an American identity, but that relies on a mythical history that predates him. Christian nationalism is a threat to religious freedom because it creates in-groups of Christians, really certain types of Christians, and out-groups of everyone else. Christian nationalism sends the signal implicitly, if not explicitly, that there are first class, class faiths and second class faiths. It's harmful not only to religious minorities, including the growing number of Americans who don't identify as religious, but also to Christians like us when our faith is co-opted and distorted to bend to the power and the purposes of the state. Christian nationalism overlaps with white supremacy and leads to the subjugation of racial minorities. Because Christian nationalism poses these threats to the, set, to the faith freedom for all, BJC has been devoting a great deal of our time and resources over the past 18 months to supporting the Christians Against Christian Nationalism initiative. And you can learn more about that at christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org. But Christian nationalism is antithetical not only to religious freedom, but also to adventurous civility. It rejects religious diversity and sees it as a threat to national cohesion. This can sometimes be obvious, violent, and even deadly, as it was on January 6, 2021 at the U.S. Capitol, as it was on June 17, 2015 at Mother Emanuel AME Church, as it was on October 27, 2018 at the Tree of Life Synagogue. But we also must watch out for the more mundane examples of Christian nationalism that sometimes show up more like exaggerated examples of so-called civil religion. In our desire to overcome our differences, we Americans can try to find things that we have in common. The danger in my view is when we try to do that through our religious faith. Put simply, Christianity does not unite us as Americans Neither do Judeo-Christian values, a term that was invented about a century ago to make room for Catholic and Jewish pluralism, but that has been used more recently to exclude those from other faith backgrounds or to suggest that our government has a quasi-religious origin and function. I recently wrote for Religion News Service about a misguided effort to bind Americans together by adopting Christian symbols, language, and imagery. It came to my attention when I was engaged in one of the most all-American activities, watching commercials during the Super Bowl. Automa Automaker Jeep aired a two-minute ad during Super Bowl 55, dedicated to the reunited states of America. In the ad, Bruce Springsteen says, all are more than welcome to come meet here in the middle. And the accompanying image is the interior of a small chapel that has a wooden cross placed over a plaque in the shape of our country painted like the American flag. I had the same pit in my stomach when I saw this ad as I did when I heard the classic altar call hymn Amazing Grace sung during the swearing in ceremony on inauguration day. Though Amazing Grace may be familiar to most Americans, not everyone shares the faith evangelized in it. Though well-intentioned, I think that both the ad and the inaugural hymn are failed attempts at civility. Both call on Americans who are deeply divided to come together, but they do so by minimizing our meaningful differences, ones that I would say are most meaningful, and that is how we engage with the most profound questions of life. I don't think that Roger Williams would approve of this approach to civility, which is polite, but neither adventurous nor respectful. We Baptist Christians are called to something higher, both in the way that we engage with our neighbors in church and outside the church. May we be willing to be bold prophets for gospel truth and defenders of religious dissent even when, especially when, it's difficult to do so. Amen.
Greetings, church. Welcome to God's own table. We gather today joined in the spirit of our living God around our many tables in our various places, trusting that we are united in this act. We gather to remember, to share, and to bless. We remember the goodness of God. We remember who gathers with us. We remember the story and the example of Jesus. We bless these elements and we share them with one another in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Pray with me. God of justice and bounty, in your new day, the world is filled with good things. We ask that you bless these gifts of field and vine and human labor. Our God, we pray that we would find you again in these ordinary elements on our shared tables. Even when we are not in one place, may we find in this bread your wholeness. May we find in this cup your joy. Fill our humble bellies with your wonder as you bless this bread and this cup. Bless our hearts with fullness that they may nourish us as we serve and feed your world. Amen. Friends, the requirement for sharing in this meal is that you hunger and you thirst after God's love and righteousness. This is Christ's table. So come, you who feel weak and unworthy. Come, you who are here often and you who have stayed away. Come, you who love Jesus and you who wish you could. Come, sinners and saints, women and men, gay and straight, cisgendered and trans, Come, you who are sober and you who are not. Come, you who are houseless and you who have a place to rest your head. Come, you who are citizens of this land and you who are not. Here, you are citizens in the realm of God. Now join with God's people in this feast prepared for you from the beginning of the world. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his friends and loved ones, as was his custom, to enjoy a meal. And after he blessed the bread, Jesus took it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. As often as you eat this, do so and remember me. Take and eat this bread of life. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant poured out in me. As often as you drink this, do so and remember me. Take and drink this cup of heaven. Join me in prayer. We thank you, God, for this feast. We remember who we are and whose we are. We remember those you have given us to love. Thank you for this bread of life, this cup of joy. Thank you for the ways that you strengthen and sustain us. May we take this feast 
into our very being and continue to be your body in the world. Amen. Friends, we continue to share this meal by ensuring that others are fed. We ask that as you go from this place, from your home, as you go about your life in this week, that you would make a contribution to an organization that distributes food to those who are going without, like Better Lives Rhode Island here locally, or another organization in your area. This is how we share this feast. This is how we live as the body of Christ. As our service concludes here today, we are grateful again to Amanda Tyler for the word that she brought us today. And we pray that you would continue to be filled with God's strength and joy and goodness. So now, go out into the world to serve God with love. Make room at your table for unexpected guests. And when the work of discipleship leaves you weary or frustrated, rest in Christ's presence and listen. And may the blessing of God go with you this day and all your days. Amen and go in peace.